The, uh, I want to show you some pictures. That's not, those aren't my notes. Um, y'all may wish they were my notes, but they're not. Um, so just, we started, you know, we said we were going to have two ministry projects um, that we're connecting with that focus-wise. One of them is Rice Elementary School. Uh, the other is the food bank. And so i got to get my days right. On Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday we carried some uh, snacks over for the 4 and 5K. Um, and I noticed, and I bought, we bought exactly what they asked for. We're not on the nutrition plan, okay? <laughs> um, but it was neat to see their reaction because uh, we had started and had some conversations with them. So we did this. And I don't think I got the pictures to them for the bagels. Uh, but then on Wednesday morning, uh, we carried over 100 bagels to the staff uh, with cream cheese and juice uh, just to be able to say to those teachers and that staff, thank you. Uh, and the idea is that as we go and continue to love, in a few weeks I'm going to be there for water day. It's during the daytime. So if some of you want to go and get wet, you have that ability, let me know. Um, but it's June the 25th. And so I get to go on my bathing May 25th, not June 25th. Okay, just nobody wants to go to school. Um, but, you know, they're letting us in their school, wearing our T-shirts and just loving on people. And out of that, I truly believe we'll get to have gospel discussions. We'll get to talk about why we do that. So um, that was the part of the beginning of this week. Now, where did the cordless mic go? So we're talking about moms today. So this is the part where it becomes interactive and it's small enough I can wander around. So who's willing to tell me something in the mic that your mom taught you? Oh, I knew Tim would, would get me started. But it's not a diatribe. Tell me something your mom taught you. Be ready with the mute. Anybody else? Oh, look. See, this one's, a, th- see, this one's easy for most of us. Hold on, I'm coming. She taught me the golden rule. Golden rule. Tell us what the golden rule is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm-hmm. My mother taught me that nobody ever promised us that life was going to be fair. <laughs> oh, amen. Amen. And mom, and mom already has her head down. This is bad. How to play baseball. How to play baseball. Anybody else? Oh, hold on. I'm coming back there. I'm working. So I can't do this at River Street. And I'm sorry I gave her the mic, okay? <laughs> I'll pass that one down there, and I just keep giving it to the children. You don't always get what you want. Uh, that's true. <laughs> okay. To always smile. To always smile. Some days I forget that. Anybody else? Okay, so, and most of us can think about things that our moms taught us. That life isn't always fair, that we can be, if we try, a lot of the things the world says we can't be, okay? But now, let me ask you another question, and I'm not going to walk around with this one. But think about some of the things your mom taught you, because we were doing it with, Mary Jo and I were doing it with her child uh, before service. We were, I was giving him some peppermint uh, out of the dish in my office. And so mom was still teaching, thank you, yes, sir, no, sir. So how do the things your mom taught you impact how you live today? Are there lots of times you think, my mom taught me that, my dad taught me that? Do you ever, because I say yes, sir, and no, sir, or yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, to to folks who are younger than me most of the time. My kids can still hear me going, yes, what? 
because that's what I heard. I still learned that. It impacts how I live and how I, what comes out of me. You know, it's, they were imparting knowledge to you. But if it only stayed up here, that's why yes what matters to my children. Because they've heard it is yes ma'am, yes sir. All they have to hear is yes what and it unlocks this. So there's a transfer in them. Knowledge is amazing of how it impacts what we do. A child, when we talk about, especially coming from the Baptist denomination, you talk about inviting Christ into your heart. And they're like, how can Jesus fit in my little bitty heart? They don't understand. So you have to be careful with those words. When the, they thought the world was flat, the sailors would not leave sight of the shore. What they know impacted what they did. In this letter, as Paul is writing to the church at Coloss, remember he hasn't, he hasn't visited there. He starts talking to them about what it might look like and how their faith is played out. Now I'm going to go ahead, and there's one of these verses that kind of talks, it hints at this. Paul, the other part of Paul's letter is the word Gnosticism, that people could have a special knowledge of Scripture, okay, only being imparted to some, okay, he's fighting against that. And we believe that because the Holy Spirit lives in us and through us that each of you can understand Scripture, okay? You don't ha- I don't have to come and interpret scripture, scripture for you. I think that's part of my job, but you can study this and understand it on your own. Okay, So listen as Paul writes, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. He says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. And for those at Laodicea, remember we see Laodicea over in the seven churches in Revelation. And for all who have not met me personally, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. goes back to the Gnosticism right there. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Now 6 and 7 he says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, the first part of that, I, he says, I want you to know how hard I am fighting for you. How, far, how hard I am working that you may know Christ. Well, uh, when, I don't remember which week it was. One of those first five weeks the week two through six, we were talking about some core values, about growing people change, okay? That part of our job is for you to grow and mature in Christ, all right? That's hard work. Paul says, I am striving hard that you may know Christ, that you may know him completely. Well, I, I think and I know that at eight years old, When I ask Jesus to be my Savior, or when we see kids go through confirmation, and we have those questions about, do you believe? Are you committing yourself to the church and to God? Most importantly, God. Okay? I believe that I don't have to have all of my understanding of Christ. I understand that I need Him, and I have to ask for that grace and that forgiveness, which is poured out. I have to realize I have faith. John Wesley said, my heart was strangely warm 
It was that moment where he understood he believed in Christ Jesus. It's not easy. It's a, something that we have to grow into, that we have to work at. Okay, It's part of that maturing process. I can think of some lessons along my teenage years that weren't easy. Kay's bobbing her head. She's like, I wouldn't have married him if I had known him when he was a teenager. Because she's heard all the stories. The other thing is I can think about some of the lessons I've learned along as an adult. Hmm. They taught me some things. And they weren't always easy. Paul says, I want you to know how hard I'm working for you and for that community that you live in. My goal is that you may be encouraged. And he says that you might be united in love. That you might be woven together like a piece of fabric or a rope that has more than a single piece of twine of cotton string, if I pulled on it, comes across. I always looked at those cables that held me up when I drove a floating forklift at Edgecombe. Or they picked up the big steel when I worked there. The single little bitty piece looked pretty fragile. And that cable that was woven together, just twisted together, would pick up 40,000 pounds and carry it all around and never fail. Matter of fact, you could even look at it we were supposed to start changing them when we saw the cracks. But even when the outside layers were cracked some, it's still whole, still woven together. That's a challenge because some of us, we don't want anybody doing anything for us. Mmm. Hello, Western culture. We don't. We struggle with it. I, your pastor, I'll tell you, it's one of those spots I struggle. They already know it, Renee. I want you to know knowing Christ takes hard work. But then you start looking. Give me the second point. Make sure that I can. Okay. <laughs> ah, thank you. Nope, that's the title. That was the one we just did. Ha, ah, there we go. This one was longer. I couldn't remember it. Living your knowledge. Head knowledge, what we know, and then ultimately your belief through your feet, and it should be and your hands, and I didn't tell them that, is the goal. Okay? When all of a sudden that knowledge of who you are, the idea of united in Christ is amazing, and next week that's going to be really a lot of what we talk about, about how we should be united. But then it also talks later in that verse, he says that you may have complete understanding to the mysteries of Christ. That you might understand. And I think one of the challenges for me is that I look at each of you and each of the people I meet not with what John sees, but what Christ sees. Because what Christ sees is his creation. That you may or may not be in a right relationship with God, but you're still his child. Some of you in here right now can think about, Tim told us part of the story a couple of weeks ago, of separation between him and his daughter. You can think of that prodigal child. Can't you? I, can, I don't have that with my children. I hope I never do. But I can think of it with fa family members. And you know what? They're still part of my family. Christ looks at everybody I encounter as a child of God. And all of a sudden, I have to change because I know that. Most of you would say that. He tells us to love God and to love others. How many of you knew that? Oh, y'all are lying. There's not enough hands up in the room. You do. You know it. But the question is, how do I live it? How does it actually live out? Because it becomes hard sometimes. Because I'm like, I want to see them get theirs. 
two verses prior to what I read you at 28 and 29. He said, he, and nobody has this one on the screen behind me, Christ is the one we proclaim. One gospel, one good news. Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so they may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Growing people change. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. What would it look like if you took all the knowledge you have about Christ and started to live it out? How many of you wore your seatbelts this morning riding here? I grew up in a time where I didn't have to have a seatbelt. I don't like seatbelts. I don't. And when we lived in South Georgia, I didn't wear them a lot as a 30-something-year-old. And my kids would remind me, put your seatbelt on. <laughs> Hannah won't leave the driveway. Put your seatbelt on. <laughs> Good job, okay? But you know why I wear my seatbelt? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> because I've known too many people that didn't have them on, and they aren't here today. Because the, the terminology that seatbelts save lives, I know. And it changes what I do. If you knew it was going to rain today, how many of you would have brought one of these? I don't particularly use umbrellas a lot. They're not something I, I like. I know I won't melt, okay? Some of y'all going, yep. This umbrella will not open and close itself. I can hold this thing up here all day. It's like, open! It's not going to happen. But I know how to keep the rain off my head, don't I? <laughs> I open it. Some of you are going, he just opened an umbrella in the building. Your God is bigger than that, okay? <laughs> all right. It takes intentionality of knowing you're going to do something to let your head knowledge, to allow your heart, mark out the bottom line you got, uh, allow your heart to be the conduit of your belief to your hands and feet so that others may see Christ live in you and through you. What would it look like if we had 20 people, that's not even half the room at a fall festival. What would it look like in here if each family invited one person to church next week? Each family, not each person, would need overflow. But you know what? There would be some people who don't know Christ in that. What would it look like? When we started trying to intentionally go across the street to know the neighbor that we've never met. Jesus said to love him and to love others. You already know it. But you have to be willing to allow that to be lived out in your hands and your feet. Your heart is that conduit from your hidden knowledge and what we've taught you so much and so long into living like Christ. My challenge to you for this week is to think about something right now. Here in just a minute, they're going to, they're playing, y'all playing? As the band comes to play us out, got to think about something you need to change this week. How you, you got it up here, but it's either not being lived out here, here, or here. And try to change it this week. Because your mama taught you well. And the scriptures teach you even better. That's the challenge for this week. To allow your heart to be the conduit of your faith in your hands and in your feet this week.